You're listening to Mike Adams and Chris Savory, the record collectors from the BBC. Our special guest on The Collectors this evening is Adam Faith. At long last, we tracked the man down, and the question is, will the real Adam Faith stand up? Entrepreneur, financial whiz kid, uh, actor extraordinaire, and a man of, a, of more than 20 hit records. I remember in America, before the Beatles broke, it said England's number one pop singer album. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, I do. What brings you into the public eye, Adam, at the moment? Alfie. I'm doing a play called Alfie. It's amazing because most people think that they know Alfie, but of course they do from the film, but very few people have seen the play. So doing the play is a, it's like bringing a new play to the theatre, and yet it's what, nearly 30 years old. Well, Alfie will be coming to the Midlands area at Birmingham and to our northern area, you can see it in Manchester. And I'll give you all the dates of Alfie later in the programme. Let's go back to your beginnings, though. Terence from Acton uh -huh. uh, and your sort of first sort of connection with anything to do with the media or showbiz was with the Rank organisation in the cutting room, wasn't it? Well, that's right. I was a messenger boy for Rank. And then I became an assistant editor in the cutting rooms because I wanted to be a director. Actually, I wanted to be an actor. I went to see James Dean in the sort of mid-50s when I was thinking about what I was going to do when I left school. I was about to leave school at 15 and I saw James Dean and I wanted to be an actor. But in those days, there was no way in the mid-50s a working-class kid was going to become an actor. And it just didn't happen. And so I thought the next best thing would be is to become a film director. And so, I, after persevering with different jobs, I finally got myself a job with a film company as a messenger boy. And I thought, you know, I don't care what I do, I sweep the floor, as long as I'm in, then I can figure out a way to become a film director once I get a job in a film company. And once I'd become a messenger boy for rank, I was in the film business, basically. It was just up to me then to try to make progress. Now you so I sort of got diverted in, into pop singing from there because there were six messenger boys and Lonnie Donegan had just exploded onto the scene Skiffle was the biggest thing that had ever happened and it was the first time actually that ordinary kids were thinking about what it would be like to be in music up to then it was like a thing that nobody, no ordinary kids thought about <coughs> Excuse me. and there were hundreds of thousands of kids all over Britain that played three kids chords on a guitar and a string bass with a tea chest and a washboard. And it was like it was people's music, which had always been in America, but had never been in England before. What was the first rock record that you can remember influencing you as a young man? I think the one that had the, the most... In, well, Lonnie had an enormous influence. And I remember Rock Island Line was actually the first record that sort of changed... What seemed to me to be so different from anything I'd ever heard before uh, commercially because I'd heard folk music and all that but Rock Island Line and Lonnie Donnick and the Skiffle Group was an amazing thing Now I have an album here on the deck which is when you produced many years later what I consider when they remake records often it's not as good as the original but by golly this was a much better version and here is you as a producer and Donnegan's really rock out in line and that was rock out in line Lonnie Donegan produced by Adam Faith a cracking with Richie Blackmore on guitar. with Richie Blackmore great start right? a great guitarist I was with uh, Paul and Linda McCartney in LA one year and we were sitting at the house we were going out to rehearse well I picked them up at their house to go to watch Paul's rehearsal at the forum in LA when he was doing his first tour in America as a, as a solo artist and uh, after the gig uh, we had a, there was a party upstairs and we were sitting at a table and at the table was me Paul and Linda Nielsen Harry Nielsen Cher Elton John John Bonham from Led Zeppelin and Ringo all sitting around and Paul and Linda started to take the mickey out of me with uh, Budgie and Charlie Endel impersonations because Cher and Harry Nielsen sort of sat there with glazed looks on there they never heard of Budgie and then they started on about what do you want and started singing all my old songs 
So get them off it. I got them onto Lonnie Donegan. I said, never mind that. What about Lonnie Donegan? Everyone at the table. Elton, everyone, all singing Lonnie Donegan songs. And before I left, I said, we ought to make an album with Lonnie. Before I left, I got them all to agree that if I went back to England the next day to find Lonnie, we'd make an album with him. And that's exactly how that album came about. I went back to England the next day and flew straight from LA to Heathrow, went from one terminal to another and got on a plane to Glasgow and found Lonnie doing a gig in Glasgow. And I said to him, all these great rock stars want to be on your album, want to make an album, he couldn't believe it. He could not believe it. And there was no rock star that I asked to be on the album that turned me down. They all wanted to be on Lonnie's album. So that was your early influence. Lonnie was my early influence. You actually went, by strange coincidence, to the top rank label before you went on to EMI Polyphone, didn't you? I How did. did that come about? Because I was doing a show called Drumbeat, which was the sort of rival to Shindy. Well, not Shindy, uh, Oh Boy. Oh Boy. It was the BBC's rock rival to Oh Boy. And I was offered a, from that show, I was offered a contract with Top Rank. I did two, two, two records for them, both which were sh of sort of huge failures. And then I... One was called Our, Our Poor Little Baby. Our Poor Little Baby. And the other one was called... Rushy Bunk. Runk Bunk. Runk Bunk. Bunk. I think. <laughs> and then the show went on and on and on. And one thing led to another. And I got contract with Parlophone. And John Barry and Johnny Worth, who were working on the same show with me, came to me one day and said, we've got a song for you. And it was what he want. And here it is. That was Adam Faith and the classic What Do You Want. Van Dyke and Johnny Worth, were they one of the they same? They were one of the same, yeah. And uh, I don't know why Johnny, I can't remember why Johnny decided to change his name from Worth to Van Dyke. I suppose he thought Van Dyke sounded a bit sort of sharper than Worth. <laughs> There's, there was a, a quirk of fate with uh, Lonnie Donegan, because I remember a record which went, you can make a fortune writing Adam Faith songs that Absolutely. Donegan sang. Well, I drove Lonnie mad for years. I said, write me a song, write me a song, write me a song. And I was doing a pantomime at Wimbledon. He came in one evening, he said, I've got, I've got your song. And he played Have a Drink to me. And I never, ever got round to recording it, so he got fed up with me in the end. He said, look, if you don't record this song, I'm going to do it myself. So he changed the line in it. He <laughs> changed it <laughs> to take the mickey out of me. Right, saying, right, you should have recorded this bloody song because it had been a hit. It was only it was about number three. Yes. Yes, it did very well for you. Oh, it. yeah, it, it did it very, well. very well. <coughs> moving, moving on from that, of course, you had a string of hits like uh, Poor Me, which was the title of a book, Adam Faith. Uh, uh, yeah, that's which right. It, which, that's right. Had, which, it, which at 19 was an autobiography, right? <laughs> what, uh, what the hell had happened at 19? <laughs> Nothing. A lot of people in the press, I remember the NME particularly and DISC, saying that they thought you owed a lot of your musical uh, background to Buddy Holly. Now, all those years afterwards, would you say that was true or false? Not really. I think where that came from was I wasn't particularly a fan of Buddy Holly, actually. I was more Elvis Presley and Gene Vincent were my, the people I liked. And uh, I never really got into Buddy Holly in a big way. But I think where the comparison was drawn was because of the style of the uh, songs. And the strings, particularly. Yeah, those strings. They were because Buddy Holly used Pizza Carters on... What, what, what was the... There you go, baby. What, yes, what was the one he did? It doesn't either? matter anymore. That's it. He did it on... Does it, does it. And I think we came either at the same time or soon after with What Do You Want? And I think that's where the... And Buddy Holly sort of had a... Uh, a sort of a jerky way of delivering songs, didn't he? Now, anybody who's seen some of the uh, repeats on television, uh, one of the classic interviews of the early 60s, would be the face-to-face -face interview with Freeman. Face-to-face, -face, yeah. Uh, which I think possibly was the first serious rock television interview. Probably the only, the only one of its time. You know, people didn't interview rock artists at the time, did they? He asked your opinion about just about <coughs> everything, and so much of it has come true, because if you look at the autobiography, which I think was by Four Square Books, which is now very collectible, you know, you, you, you were ve your head was very well screwed on for your age, wasn't it? I mean, in the book, you say, well, now I want to move out of Acton, buy a nice place for my parents, move to, move to I think, Hen not... Um, Sun somebody on Thames, uh, I'll get a house worth £6,000, invest in property. And it was almost like you were predicting your own future. Yeah. 
Funny that. It's a, I haven't seen the interview. I tried to watch it. I, they repeated it a few years ago with Jane, Joan Bakewell, pick some out. And I sat with her in her house. She said, you know, shall we watch the interview and then we'll talk about it? I said, OK. And after a couple of minutes, I had to switch it off. It was like, it was spooky watching myself. You know, you can... It was like watching Terry Nellam speak as opposed to watching Adam Faith. So it was very freaky. I, I, I couldn't watch it. Have you got a copy of the interview at all, or the, or the, the book, even? No, I haven't got a copy of the book, but I've got a copy of the interview. Well, my daughter's got it, actually, and uh, she's taking it to America with her. Well, I'm going to choose a track now by Van Dyke because that was the first rock interview, and it is called Face to Face. That was Adam Faith and Face to Face. Let's move on very quickly to the middle 60s, the Mersey beat sound. But you changed your style when many others weren't. You involved yourself with the roulettes. I did, yeah. I thought it was time to get my own group together and be self-sufficient rather than putting a new band together every time. It, you know, it became the, it became, uh, the trend, didn't it, to put your own band together. And uh, I put the roulettes together. And I always thought they were actually, they were a wonderful band. Do you ever see the boys now? I do. I see them now and again, and I've just had a birthday party for my wife. And a couple of them came along. They didn't play music like this, by the way. <laughs> uh, and a couple of them came along to a party, and they bought some guitars with them. Oh, there I was, turn the music off. And they bought some guitars, and I joined in with them. It's the first time I picked up a guitar in 25 years. And my daughter, who's 21, came up to me after and said, my God, I didn't know you could play the guitar. She'd never seen me with a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> Gave me a thirst, actually, for playing. We played all the old skiffle and folk stuff and blues stuff that we all brought up on as kids. So it gave me a thirst for doing it again. I haven't felt that for 25 years. Because your acting career, I mean, it goes back to films 30 years ago. You were in Beat Girl and, of course, that quite a nice comedy called What a Whopper, which yeah. was a spook on Loch Ness Monster, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a real British comedy, wasn't it? It was like one of those carry-on films. Great. And, you know... I see snatch of it sometimes when they play it late night, and so I think, well, what fun that was doing that. It was such good fun. Was it filmed in Scotland? No, it was all filmed in Pinewood. <laughs> <laughs> Funny, it all looks like Scotland. Uh, and then, of course, you actually trod the, uh, you actually went on the stage and, and played with quite a few famous actors, particularly actresses. I played uh, the first job. When I gave up singing in the mid-60s, 66, I thought, right, I'm going to give up singing and become an actor. And I figured the only way to do it and convince people that I was serious was to actually totally give up singing. And so I wrote to every rep company I could think of in England and asked if they could give me a job. And one of the... F the well, the, the first job I got, and it was by coincidence, the woman that was managing me at the time met a bloke at a party and told him what I was doing, and he said, oh, I'll put a play together. He was a theatre producer, a man called Martin Tickner. <clears throat> and he put a play together for me and Sybil Thorndike to do, Night, Night Must Fall. And Sybil was the first actress I acted with on stage. Can you imagine what an initiation is? Yes. I mean, you said, I mean, your quote was, uh, was that actors don't give advice, but they give encouragement. Yeah, great. You know, actors don't give advice to each other on how to act, but they, they can encourage each other, and she encouraged me, and she made, gave me confidence that I could do it the way she talked to me about my acting and gave me the confidence and belief that I, you know, I could pull it off. A wonderful woman. That was Night Must Fall. Now, Alfie, written by Bill Norton, is going up and down the country. As I said earlier, it will be in Birmingham and it is in Manchester. And I will tell you the dates where you can see Adam Faith, so it is properly covered. But your views, you, many people listening to this will know you through the Mail on Sunday and through your articles on finance. And it seems to me that you're sort of multifaceted your talents in so many different ways, but the arts are never far away. Where do you see finance and arts? Do you ever see the two merging together? Or do you think that uh, the media, in fact, is, should be purely a profitable thing? No, I don't think the media. I don't think the arts. I mean, you, you have to define arts. What area of the arts would you talk about? The theatre in your case, and well, perhaps music as well. I think, you know, we need music and we need theatre, we need painting, uh, we need all the arts in this country because it balances life off. 
but very, very, very little of the arts can be profitable on its own. It has to be subsidised. And we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't resent the money that goes to the arts. It comes back to us in all sorts of ways. And of course, if you go on a commercial tour like Alfie, I'm going out as a commercial tour. If it doesn't make money, then it's my fault and it's up to me to stand the loss. But National Theatre and National Opera Companies, concert uh, orchestras, art galleries, you know, there are we've museums, we've got to have that in this country. Do you think broadcasting should be totally commercial or not? No, I don't think the BBC should be commercialised in any shape or form. I think we should, in fact, I think we should increase the licence to allow the BBC a breathing space because if you try to cut costs on the BBC, you kill the whole essence of what the BBC is about. And there are very few things this country does that is the best in the world, bar none. And making television programmes for the last 30 years have been the BBC's, they've been the best in the world. There's never been one company in the world that's been able to lick them. And we shouldn't throw that away by forcing them to compete with commercial channels. Let's raise the licence fee. Give pensioners a fee, f a licence for nothing, and the rest of us, let's pay a little bit extra and let the BBC develop, and it, they develop huge talent for this country. They're like a, they're like a research centre for talent. And the, incredible advert for this country all over the world. You know, when you think of BBC World Radio, for instance, and not long ago they were talking about cutting costs on BBC World Radio. Cutting World Radio down. When you get Gorbachev, when he was kidnapped and in Russia, in his DACA, saying the only thing that saved him was the BBC World Service. I mean, this is the President, Prime Minister of Russia saying that BBC World Service gave him the news. And he trusted the BBC to give him the honest truth and he knew what the truth was because he'd heard it on BBC. Terry Waite said that the thing that sustained him was BBC World Radio. And we think of cutting that cost, we should be thinking of making nights of them all. Well, I, I'm not paying you for this interview, so thank you very much for the compliment on behalf of the BBC. But let's move ahead to you now. There's Alfie. What next? What future ventures are there for you? Where will you go to next? Will you actually go back to the recording studio with an album? Now the years have passed and your, your music's been appreciated. It's been played a lot more now. There's a resurgence of interest. You were the first hit record of the 60s after all second uh, Yeah, I spanned the decades, didn't I? I was, what Do You Want was number one the last week of 59 and it was still number one the first week of the 60s. I always, you know, I only realised that not long ago and it sort of tickled me pink that I, was, I crossed it into the 60s. You swapped places for one week with uh, What Do You Want To Make Those Eyes At Me For? What and then a you great went, record that was. Yes. That was a, that, Emil Ford. Great record. Any memories at all of, the, of those days you can tell us briefly? Any happy days, or, or particularly of the popular music side of the 60s that you, uh, are amusing to you? Uh, oh, God, you know, it was such... It was, it was so fast-moving. It was a blur. I mean, one of my favourite times of that uh, was the M1 cafe, the Blue Boar cafe on the M1. The M1 was the only stretch, 63 miles, I think, of, M <laughs> of motorway in that time. And it was like a nightmare travelling from one town to another, except that little bit. And we were all on tour, all at the same time, crossing all over the Britain. And the one place we always used to bump into each other was at the M1 Blue Boar Cafe at 2 o'clock in the morning, coming home from gigs. And that was really like, it was like a rock and roll club there in those <laughs> early 60s. It was great. Finally, you pick the last track for us to go out on, Adam. Which, which Anything you'd like of your own. Of my own. <clears throat> of my own. I made an album in the 70s and I wrote, a, I, I co-wrote it with Dave Courtney, wrote all of Leo Sayers' songs with him. And it's always a track that I've got a sort of an affection for because I just had a car crash and we wrote this song in Barbados, in a hotel in Barbados with a sunburn and, and I was in crutches and plaster and we called it I Survive. And here it is, I Survive. Adam Faye, thank you very much for being our guest on BBC's Record Collectors. My pleasure.